The Peter Schiff Show. Well, the U.S. economy and Fed cheerleaders are still clinging to the recovery fantasy, uh, the miracle of the U.S. economic recovery engineered uh, by Fed policy, despite all of the evidence that is now coming to the fore that shows that the effects of all this monetary stimulus are already wearing off, even before the Fed has come around to take away the punch bowl. Just the mere fact that they're not serving up as much new alcohol and we're already uh, going into a hangover. The Dow Jones was down about 186 points today on Wednesday, and we were down about 330, 340 on the lows uh, before, I think, a, a, a late rally in the crude oil market. Crude ended up up about two and a half bucks, probably the first up day in crude in, in a long time. Uh, and maybe somebody bought stocks based on the rally in crude. So we closed off the lows, but considerably off of Monday's open or Tuesday's open rather, because yesterday the Dow Jones opened up 250 points higher right out of the gate. We were up 300 or so in the first half hour of trading and the market sold off. We ended up down almost 100 at one point. I think we closed down maybe 20, 25 points. But between yesterday's high and today's low, the Dow sunk 600 points. We're having a lot of volatility, most of it now to the downside. The technicals are really worsening. We we have some support now around today's lows, which are a key level because we also tested the lows from a couple of days ago. But if we take out those lows this week, you know, we didn't make a new high. And every time we've had a big dip and then we've rallied, the people who buy the dip have been rewarded because the market's made a new high. Well, we had a a big dip, um, what, just a, in early January. And then we had a big rally. We had a spectacular couple-day rally. But we didn't take out the highs from late December. And now we're back down to the lows. We tested the lows of the early January dip. If we take out those lows, in fact, I think if we close below the December low, remember that sell-off around mid-December 17th, we do that. We close below that. We can have a much bigger decline. We can move down to around 16,000 on the Dow, down from 18,000 at the end of last year. That would be a big enough decline that I think the Fed might have to come to the rescue with a clearer indication that rates are not only not going to rise anytime soon, uh, but that QE3 or QE4 rather uh, is being considered Uh, They might need to do that. They they have to bring out the heavy artillery in order to uh, prop up the stock market. They cannot let the stock market go into a bear market because, again, one of the pillars of this phony recovery is the stock market. It's the wealth effect. And it's not just the stock market that's in trouble. It is the real estate market that's in trouble. Look, despite the fact that the government is now letting people buy a house with 3% down, that's the new Fannie and Freddie loan. 3% 3% down. They're, they're desperate to, to sucker more people into the real estate market to try to prop it up. You know, the whole, whole idea about buying a house with 3% down, think about how crazy this is with taxpayer guarantees. Let's say you buy a house for $300,000, right? Which is still, I think, higher than the medium home price in the United States. If you put 3% down, that's only $9,000. $9,000. I mean, what if somebody buys a house with 3% down. I mean, $9,000, you know, I mean, yeah, that's, you know, that's a decent amount of money for most people. Maybe if it's, if it's, it's let's say it's a $200,000 house, which you could buy, maybe at 3%, you're talking six grand. But, you know, when you move into an apartment, you got to pay first, last, and security deposit. So that still costs money. But let's say it's a $200,000 house, make it more realistic. You put down $6,000. What if you put down $6,000 and then you, you never even make your first mortgage payment? You just give the, give the, the, the seller the $6,000, you get a 97% financing guaranteed by the taxpayer, and then never make another mortgage payment. It's probably going to take the U.S. government or the bank two to three years to evict you. So let's say you get to live in the house for three years without making any mortgage payments. You paid $6,000 up front to rent the house for three years. That's only $2,000 a year. 
Well, how much is that per month? You'd end up paying $167 a month rent. That's a great deal. In fact, the best way to rent a house right now is to buy one with 3% down, intending not to make a single mortgage payment. Just default on your very first payment and then see how long it takes the government to get you evicted. Or it's not actually the government, it's the lender. But the foreclosure process is very, very lengthy. And don't think people won't do this. People aren't dumb, right? When you let somebody buy a house with 3% down, you're really giving them a free put, right? You're saying, hey, you know, just write this small check. That's why you need a significant down payment. If you make somebody put down 20% and they buy the $200,000 house, well, now, now they got to put down real money. Now they got to put down $40,000, Right. So no, you're not going to walk away with that. But for six thousand bucks to rent a house for two or three years, you know, a lot of people are going to do that. But the government doesn't care. Right. They want to goose the, the housing market. In fact, that's probably why we just saw a big increase in in mortgage purchase mortgage applications, because people are now trying to take advantage of these three percent down payment loans, courtesy of the U.S. taxpayer. But we also got this news out from KB Homes. Uh, one of the big publicly traded home builders, the stock dropped by the most in 22 years on the news that they would miss their first qu fourth quarter numbers. And so that's the biggest drop in 22 years in one day. That includes right the bursting of the housing bubble. And this is a home building stock. And what KB Homes mentioned or talked about was their margins are under pressure because of all the extra incentives they have to throw in uh, in order to move their homes, in order to convince somebody to buy a house, uh, they had to throw a lot of free things in to get the sale to close. Well, that's like reducing prices without reducing prices, right? And that's what happened at the beginning of the bursting of the last housing bubble. Home builders were reluctant to reduce prices. So instead, they included free stuff with the purchase. Maybe, maybe we'll put a swimming pool in. We'll give you the, the premium uh, countertops or, you know, in some cases, I remember the developers were putting cars, brand new cars in the garage. So the car came with the house, right? And, but all these incentives decreased the builder's profits, but they didn't have to actually lower the selling price of their homes. Well, I think that's what's coming. Selling prices are going to have to come down. And that's with record low mortgage rates. That's with Fannie and Freddie reducing uh, the down payment requirements. That's with the FHA now reducing what it charges low down payment buyers for their uh, mortgage insurance. And we're, again, I mentioned on my last um, podcast how we've got a the, the highest rate of auto loan delinquency since 2008. And again, that's because we scraped the bottle of the barrel thanks to the government to try to stuff the channel on these bailed out auto companies so they could sell cars. We made sure that People could buy them, even if they couldn't really afford them. And we're making the same mistake. But despite that, you're already starting to see the other pillar of the bubble recovery, the housing market, topple already, already, uh, even though the Fed hasn't raised interest rates at all. In fact, mortgage rates have come down thanks to this flight to safety into the U.S. Treasury market because everybody believes that we have a real recovery and that we're going to raise rates. And so foreigners want to get into the U.S. Treasury market as a proxy for the dollar, and they want to get out of the euro where everybody is convinced they're going to do QE. Well, I still think the odds are better that we do QE than Europe. And even if Europe does it, it'll be on a trivial scale that won't amount to much, whereas we're going to go all in, right? And the question is, how much more of this bad economic data are we going to get, and how much lower are the stock markets going to trade before the Fed uh, shows their hand? Now, the numbers that we got today, retail sales, and this was a big number, and it was a big disappointment. And in fact, the stock market futures sold off right after this number came out. Also, the dollar sold off, gold rallied, but the dollar uh, recovered most of its losses, and gold gave up its gains throughout the course of the day. But I think if more people believe these numbers, right, uh, you would see a bigger move in the foreign exchange market. But this this perception is dying hard. People are clinging to this fantasy as long as they can. Uh, and it might take Janet Yellen herself coming out and, and admitting, more so than, you know, the Bayes book came out today, and in that the Fed did express some concerns over the sluggishness of holiday sales, and they were a little bit worried about 
the ramifications of lower oil prices, but they still seemed uh, rather uh, optimistic, if not subdued optimism. Uh, and maybe that even is why we got a little bit of a recovery in the stock market towards the end of the day, even though we still closed down over 180 points. Uh, because anytime there's any kind of communique from the Fed, the markets tend to uh, buy into that and the stocks get bid up. But listen to retail sales, because everybody is expecting the U.S. consumer to really just hit the malls big time because of their tax cut from cheap oil. Right. Oil prices keep coming down and the consumers are now flush with cash. Right. Even though I mentioned there was a story last week, I think I mentioned it in an earlier podcast, um, that 40 percent of American households don't even have five hundred dollars saved up five hundred dollars. So you save 20 bucks on gas. You're going to go run to the mall, put it in your savings account. You don't even have five hundred bucks. Why would we want Americans to spend anything when they're so broke? You're living paycheck to paycheck. You have an extra five or 10 bucks because you saved money on the gas tank. You know, save the money. And maybe that's what Americans are doing or pay off some of your credit card debts with that money. It's not like, you know, the extra cash was there anyway. I mean, a lot of Americans are buying gasoline with borrowed money. So it means they just borrow less when the gas price is lower. That doesn't mean they go borrow more and go spend the difference at, you know, at, at, in a, at a shopping mall. But, of course, if Americans are going to do the right thing and save more money, of course, that means we go through a recession, which is exactly what we need. Unfortunately, they're not saving. They're, they're, you know, they're spending it. Maybe they're spending the money on Obamacare. That's where their, 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 their gasoline savings are going. But people are expecting this windfall. So they were, Wall Street was optimistic about this retail sales number. Right? This is going to be great. Right? This is going to be a good number. They were looking for retail sales X. uh autos and X gasoline to be up six tenths. And the reason I say even X gasoline is because they know that gasoline sales might be down because the prices are down. So unless people responded to cheap gas prices by driving their cars more, if they just simply drove the same amount, but paid less for the gas, then there would be a drop in retail sales, you know, because of gas. So they wanted to take the gas out of it. So they were looking for retail sales, X gasoline and X automobiles to be up by six tenths of a percent. Instead, we were down by three tenths of a percent. They got the direction wrong and they were way up on the magnitude. So from expectations of up 0.6, instead, we got down 0.3. That was the biggest decline in, in that number, retail sales number, since June of 2012. Since June of 2012, despite, that's two and a half year, the biggest drop, even with the cheap oil prices. So imagine how much bigger the drop would be if consumers weren't catching a break at the gas station. You know, the headline number, which includes gas, was down nine tenths, right? Maybe that's the one that was the biggest number in two and a half years, down nine tenths. Um, retail sales, they were looking for down one tenth. That was the impact of gas that they were expecting. They were looking for down one tenth. They got down nine tenths. If you look at it, just X autos, not X gas, but X autos, it was down one percent, one full percent. So these are very, very weak numbers. Wall Street was looking for positive numbers, and instead they were unexpectedly dealt a negative surprise. And in this case, bad news wasn't good news for the stock market. It it went down, but um, the dollar right, also uh, didn't sell off. It didn't rally on the news, right? But it didn't have a big sell-off. And that tells me that still people still haven't figured this out. They, they're still thinking that the Fed is going to be in tightening mode despite these numbers. They, the ramifications haven't really sunk in. But uh, if the markets continue under pressure, that Fed has no choice. You know, I, I was watching this guy on on CNBC, who had predicted the big drop in oil prices. And I don't know if he gave a time span on it, but they have this guy on. He said he was calling for 30 or $40 oil. And one of the reasons he was so bearish is he's very bullish on the dollar. And in fact, not only does he think the dollar is going to rally another 20% this year, but he also thinks the U.S. economy is going to be in recession, if not by the end of this year, by next year. And, and on that point, I agree with him. But what he doesn't seem to understand He's forecasting a U.S. recession, but he's also forecasting a strong dollar. 
I don't think that's possible because if the U.S. goes into recession, the Fed will do QE4. The only reason the dollar is strong is because people believe the Fed's going to raise rates because the economy is strong. If the Fed does QE4 because we're in recession, there goes your strong dollar. So I don't see how somebody cannot, you know, understand the inconsistencies there unless you believe that the Fed is going to sit on their hands and do nothing, which is what they should do. But they've never done that. There's no precedent for the Fed just saying, well, I guess we're going to have to suffer through a, a recession. This is, uh, you know, this is the free market for you. We got a lot of imbalances. We got a lot of problems. This economy needs to work it out. And the Fed is going to sit by and let it happen. There's not a chance that Janet Uber Dove Yellen is going to do that. I mean, Ben Bernanke didn't do it. Even Alan Greenspan didn't do it. Why should Janet Yellen, right? She is going to be the biggest money printer of them all. Uh, she's going to make Ben Bernanke blush. And I think, you know, Alan Greenspan, you know, will step up his criticism, you know, of what the Fed is doing. And that's he's actually doing it maybe as best he can. And he's advocating that people that people buy gold. So I think that these numbers are going to uh, prompt some type of action. So that would rule out the big dollar rally that this other guy was looking at, because if the U.S. economy is weak, that that knocks out the case for a strong dollar because it's predicated on a strong economy and a tight Fed. If we get the opposite of that, then all these buy dollar trades need to be reversed. What's going to be interesting is what happens in the bond market, because I think this could be very negative for the bond market, even though normally bonds respond positively to a QE. I think that now you've got a big bid in the bond market because of the strength of the dollar. Even though people expect higher rates, they're buying U.S. Treasuries anyway as a proxy on the dollar. And I think if they have to announce QE4 and now it's a game changer and people realize that it's QE infinity and that the Fed can never normalize rates, this is a permanent condition. And so there's no exit strategy and the dollar turns, that could actually be very problematic for the bond market. And especially if people grasp the ramifications of that for inflation and the purchasing power of the dollar, uh, which will you know, ex accelerate the, the desire among our creditors to dump their dollars, which means now the Fed has to buy even more than they planned. Uh, so the next QE could be bearish for bonds and the dollar. The question is, will it be bullish for stocks? I don't think so. I think it will be bullish in that it'll put a floor beneath the market. It'll prevent the stock market from crashing. But I don't think it's going to uh, cause a huge rally because you're going to have two diametrically opposing forces. One is going to be cheap money and QE4, which will be a positive for the nominal stock market. But then you have the bursting of the illusion of the economic recovery. You have people having to uh, come to terms with the weakness of our economy, that earnings estimates are likely too high. And so earnings are going to come down and the weakness in the economy uh, is going to be a negative for U.S. stocks, as will the weakness in the dollar, because that will prompt foreigners who might have been buying U.S. stocks because of their perception that the dollar would stay strong. Now they want to sell those stocks to bring the money back home to invest in other markets. You know, people who were, again, buying into the U.S. because they were worried about Europe or worried about Japan. And I said they were jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. They just didn't know it yet because they hadn't been burned. They couldn't feel the heat. Well, when the temperature starts to turn up, they're going to be looking for legitimate safe havens. Yeah, legitimate safe havens would include gold. And there are also foreign markets. There are countries. If you're looking to get out of uh, the Eurozone or out of Japan, there are plenty of countries that you can consider investing in other than the United States. Countries that are on much sounder economic footing that don't have all the liabilities. Of course, they don't issue the world's reserve currency, so they don't get the benefit of every doubt. right? But when people start to question the dollar, when they question the basic tenets and when the safe haven is no longer safe, now they're going to have to think outside the box and they're going to try to figure out where can they really put their wealth uh, to get it out of harm's way. And I think there are plenty of places around the world, except nobody is noticing that now. I think we've noticed it and we're already investing there. And I think pretty soon uh, we'll have a lot more company. Uh, but of course, by then the exchange rates and relative uh, prices of securities uh, will reflect that. But, you know, also on the anecdotal evidence of the, the U.S. economy being weed, weak, I was reading this article on Zero Hedge, and the title of their story is, the, 
the U.S. economy is so bad, even lottery sales are collapsing. And they mention, I guess it's the Powerball lottery. And sales are down uh, in, so in, the, in the first half of fiscal uh, 2015, right? They're down 40% from the first half of fiscal uh, uh, 2014. I mean, now, sure, you could say, well, this is what people do when they're desperate, right? They buy lottery tickets. So maybe a decline in lottery sales shows that people aren't as desperate as they were, and so they don't need to buy lottery tickets. I think it's more mon- more likely that they are desperate. They just can't afford the lottery tickets. So they're having to satisfy their desperation by buying fewer tickets, right? Uh, that's what I think is going on. And obviously, you know, <laughs> Maybe some people will hope that Americans will take the money they save uh, in cheap gas prices and use it to buy more lottery tickets. But, you know, not only does this really show the middle class, the poor people who normally buy these tickets, and it's unfortunate that they're conned into wasting their money gambling by the government. You know, the government, this is an example of government hypocrisy where they make it illegal to gamble and then they run lotteries. And the lotteries, the odds of winning are so slim that all and no private sector entrepreneur would dare, you know, have a lottery as rigged as the ones the governments run because nobody would buy the tickets. I mean, in the free market, you have competition uh, in gambling. And so the vigorous right that the houses take is very small. But the government, when they have a monopoly and they outlaw the competition, the vig is huge. They take a ton of money. So they, 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 they outlaw gambling under the pretense that it's immoral and it's bad. And then they promote gambling themselves on terms that are much more onerous to the gambler than would ever happen in the private sector, right? Pure government hypocrisy at its best. But, you know, if the, the states aren't going to be able to collect as much money from the lotteries because their citizens are too broke to gamble, well, then how are they going to make up the difference? So, again, just another story of... Um, more anecdotal evidence. And it's going to keep on piling up because there is no recovery. And eventually, Wall Street is going to figure that out. Not just Wall Street, but all around the world, they're going to, be, they're going to get wise to this con. Uh, but people are just living in a delusion. And speaking about the delusion, you know, it's not just limited to the people who think the U.S. economy is recovering. It's also uh, among people who unfortunately have been, uh, you know, led down uh, the wrong path with respect to these cryptocurrencies, you know, I've gotten some heat, uh, taken some heat from the Bitcoin community for warning uh, people against uh, getting in on Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin, using it as an investment, as a form of savings, uh, because I called it Tulip Mania, uh, you know, Tulip Mania 2.0. I mean, I've been very uh, vocal against Bitcoin since, uh, you know, I first noticed the big run since it was 800, 900, 1,000, 11, 1,200 dollars a coin. I've been talking about this bubble and the fact that it would burst, and I've been very consistent about that. And Bitcoin prices, once again, under incredible selling pressure, much more so than the stock market. As I'm recording this, uh, Bitcoins are about $170, $170 a coin. They hit a a low this morning on Bitstamp, which, by the way, was shut down for a number of days based on a hack where I think six or seven million dollars worth of bitcoins. Although I guess the good news is it's not six or seven million anymore because the value of those bitcoins that were stolen has gone down a lot. But at the time, that's what it was worth. Um, they were stolen, and so they had a you know the system was hacked, which was just more bad news uh, for uh, Bitcoin. But the price is one seventy. The low was one fifty two forty. One fifty two forty. We're down maybe. 25, 35% in the last couple of days. Um, I remember when I did my podcast just about talking about some tax loss selling that I thought might come in. We were still at 340. So it's been cut in half since then. Uh, but I think the people that own Bitcoins, and I feel badly for a lot of people philosophically, these are a lot of good people who unfortunately uh, just check their common sense because they got overwhelmed by greed, either financially because they thought they were going to get rich or they were just greedy for the, for the prospect of something other than government fiat money. And so they were led astray by, uh, you know, the promises of, and the hope that was, uh, you know, the surrounding Bitcoin. But, you know, the prices are going down and people are in denial. I'm reading all this stuff. 
don't worry about it. The price doesn't matter. It's the blockchain. It's the technology. The price does matter because it's the price that attracted so many people into the Bitcoin market. If the value of Bitcoins are plunging, the, the technology, the infrastructure, the blockchain isn't going to matter if nobody wants Bitcoin. It mattered when people wanted Bitcoins because they thought they could store value and, and it would be a hedge against inflation. That's not the case. And it can't be the case. That's why I said from the beginning that irredeemable digital currencies will never be money. Right? Uh, it, it, they could be vehicles for speculation. And it was. And yes, some people were able to transact with them for a while and that you still can. You can still, you know, we're, we're still uh, my gold company, Shift Gold. We've, I think we've had about 40 people who have purchased gold using bitcoins. We're still selling gold if, if you have enough bitcoins to afford it, right? You can't buy as much gold as you could have when I first announced it because when I first teamed up with uh, Bitstamp, uh, bitcoins were over $500. So you, you, with you know two, two and a half bitcoins, you could buy an ounce of gold. Now, you, what do you need now? You need five bitcoins to buy an ounce of gold. You know, pretty soon you'll need 10, then maybe 100, right? Um, but people are thinking that the price doesn't matter. And it, unfortunately, it matters a lot. It's a lot of the psychology, too. I mentioned this, that now that the price is going down, you have a big problem. And also, I'm reading about how the miners had invested a lot in this mining equipment. And now it's it costs more money to mine a Bitcoin than a Bitcoin is worth. So a lot of these miners are getting caught. They got bills. I mean, there's a lot of problems. But people who think, oh, well, the price is low. Maybe I should buy some. How do you know 170 is low? You know, a couple of years ago, they were $10. It's a long way down from 170 to 10. You know, if you buy your Bitcoin at 170 and it goes to 10, you've got a bigger loss than the guy that bought it at 1,000 and wrote it down to 150 percentage-wise. And certainly if you put in uh, a significant dollar amount. So I don't know, you know how much lower the, the market's going to go on this round. I mean, there could be another bounce. Uh, but I think it'll be very difficult uh, even to get much above 200 or two, uh, 250 or 260, which seemed like it was the last round of support. Right now, we've got some support around 150. Who knows how long that's going to hold? I mean, it held this morning, but will it last the week? Will it last two weeks? I don't know. And when we break that support, probably the next support is probably closer to 100 to 120. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we take that out. I wouldn't be surprised if we go significantly below 100. At this point, it's just a, a gambling vehicle. You know, I read that the, the Winklevi twins were uh, going to be coming out with a, you know, a Bitcoin ETF. And I, I, I doubt it's ever going to make it. But when I read the fine print on it, each of these uh, units was going to come out. They filed to raise, I think, $20 million. And each unit was worth one fifth of a Bitcoin. And they were going to price them on the IPO at $20 per unit, which meant they were valuing the Bitcoins at just $100. And at the time I read it, you know, they were $400. Like, well, why are the Wigglevi going to sell all these Bitcoins for $100 a coin? And uh, and, I, and I thought, well, maybe they, 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 they figure that if they can get rid of this many Bitcoins, even if they had to take a big haircut, it would be worth it. Well, who knows? By the time uh, this, this uh, IPO comes, maybe Bitcoins will be under 100. And of course, they won't be able to do the IPO at 100 if the Bitcoins are down at 50. But of course, maybe some of the selling in Bitcoins, if people actually think this IPO is coming public and you own Bitcoins and you know the Winklevi are going to sell their Bitcoins at $100 a coin, why wouldn't you dump your coins on the market now and then you know, buy them back on the IPO? But this whole thing seems fanciful to me that it would even be considered or somebody would buy it. But all this stuff is negative. And the problem with Bitcoin, again, is that there is no real value there. So how, I said, how do you know? Is $169 cheap or is it expensive? There's no way to know because there's no value in the coin itself. So there's no way to know. And once the price starts dropping, again, people don't want it. Right? People's friends are losing money. They're losing money. And you know the excitement is gone. And all the dreams of riches have now been turned into the reality of losses. And that's a hard sell. When everybody was rich and everybody made money, it was easy to find new converts. When everybody is losing money, when you have all these tales of woe and misery and losses, it's hard to get people to sign up uh, for the experiment. So unfortunately, this is 
not good for the cryptocurrencies. Hopefully, you know, it, it, it doesn't hurt the liberty movement or the, the idea about sound money. I keep reading a lot about how, well, Bitcoin is just like gold. It's nothing like gold in that respect. And I hope it doesn't get people to say, oh, you see, things like Bitcoin and gold don't work. You've got to keep your money in dollars or things like that. No, the dollar doesn't work either, right? Uh, but just because Bitcoin doesn't succeed doesn't mean that the dollar won't fail. The dollar is still problematic. It's a fiat currency. And maybe digital currencies backed by nothing are also fiat. They're just created um, you know, on computers by these miners. But again, there's no limit to how many digital currencies can be created into existence. And they don't have anything tangible backing them up, except the confidence that people will expect, accept them. And confidence is a very fragile thing. And it can be lost very quickly. And you can't base a monetary system on nothing but confidence. You know, we're doing it now with the dollar or the euro. Um, but there you've got the force of law. You've got tradition. You've got history. You've got a lot that helps preserve the comp confidence. You've got a military presence. But even that alone, even, even currencies, you know, backed by a government that enjoy uh, widespread confidence and support still collapse. That confidence can still be lost. But the problem is Bitcoin never had that to begin with. And so, it, it, you know, it, 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 its lifespan was a lot shorter. The rise and fall of Bitcoin is a lot quicker. And of course, it's not done yet. And it does, I don't, you know, obviously, there, who knows, maybe there'll be another short term rally. But um, I think that my, my warnings, uh, to people now, you know, to stay away from the market, to not to get involved. I think certainly anybody who listened to me a year ago and decided not to buy Bitcoins is happy that they, 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 they took my advice. And if anybody that had Bitcoins who got rid of them is probably even happier uh, that they either cashed in and realized a profit or, or avoided a significant loss. Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock-focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to look. Isn't it time you change the channel and let Euro Pacific put a little reality back into your portfolio? If you live in the United States and have $25,000 or more to invest, call 800-727-7922. That's 800-727-7922. Non-U.S. residents access similar strategies through Euro Pacific Bank at europacbank.com. Euro Pacific Capital and Euro Pacific Bank are affiliated companies.